Hi, my name is Boton Droska. I'm a neuroscientist at the Friedrich Mischer Institute in Basel, Switzerland. Hello, my name is Carl Farrow. I'm also a neuroscientist at the FMI. In the 1950s, Steve Kufler and Horace Varlow independently found that retinal ganglion cells or vertebrates have centers around receptive field organization. This means that the illumination of the photoreceptors in front of the ganglion cell drives responses in these cells, whereas the illumination of the photoreceptors in the surrounding region suppresses the cell's activity. Steve Kufler and Horace Barlow then collaborated to find that the suppressive inhibitory surround was present when the background illumination was high at daylight conditions, but was absent when the background illumination was low at nighttime conditions. They considered the appearance and disappearance of surround inhibition as an adaptive process. However, this finding was controversial since later some researchers found ganglion cells that kept their inhibitory surround at low light levels. Therefore, we asked if the loss of inhibitory surround is specific for certain types of ganglion cells, and more importantly, whether the changes occur continuously across light levels as an adaptive process, or act abruptly at a specific light level, like a switch. In order to investigate these questions in individual cell types, we turn to a mouse line in which specific types of ganglion cells are labeled with a fluorescent protein. As we scan through the retina with a two-photon microscope, you can see the different ganglion cells. We're able to distinguish several distinct cell types based on their morphology. Using patch clamp recordings, we are able to record from each cell type and evaluate the strength of its inhibitory surround at different light levels. Focusing on one particular cell type, we found that the presentation of a small spot over its receptive field center resulted in sustained volume action potentials. In bright daylight conditions, this cell type had a strong surround, such that the presentation of a large spot produces only a few spikes. This is an example of the classic center surround receptive fields described by Barlow and Kufler. In dim night-like conditions, this cell loses its inhibitory surround, such that the presentation of a small or large spot produces similar responses. By sliding through the light levels from starlight to daylight, we observed that the inhibitory surround was activated abruptly and reversibly at a critical light level like a switch. We determined this light level to be the threshold of cones. How is such a switch implemented in the circuitry of the retina? Using a combination of electrophysiology and pharmacology, we were able to isolate the key neural components. In particular, we found that the surround suppression of this ganglion cell type is mediated by the inhibitory input from a class of amicron cells that provides input directly to the ganglion cell. This inhibitory input was toggled on at the critical light level, the threshold of cones. Using monosynaptic circuit tracing techniques, we were able to visualize the anatomy of the ganglion cell and its presynaptic partners. In red is the ganglion cell, while in green and blue are two connected wide-field amicron cells. As you can see, they are very large, making them well-suited to mediating surround inhibition. From these and other findings, we put together the following model. These ganglion cells receive direct inhibitory input from a set of wide-field spiking amicron cells that we call switch cells. Both the ganglion cell and switch cell receive excitatory input from cone bipolar cells. Where the bipolar cell drives the ganglion cell via chemical synapses and the amicron cell using electrical coupling. In dim night conditions, the bipolar cell is driven by inputs from the rod pathway. This input is enough to drive the ganglion cells via chemical excitation, but is insufficient to cause the amicron cell to spike, leaving the switch broken. At light levels above the threshold of cones, the bipolar cell is driven by both the rod and cone pathway. This results in a sudden boost to the output of the bipolar cells that causes the switch cell to spike, turns the switch on, activating the inhibitory input to the ganglion cell. We were curious if there is a perceptual correlate of this switch in the retina. We decided to investigate the properties of spatial vision during the transition from dim to bright environments. To do this, we coupled a visual task that measured the spatial integration properties of our human volunteers with a second task that determined whether they could see color. 
We repeated these two tests as the ambient light level was steadily increased. At a critical light level, one particular aspect of spatial vision changed sharply. The critical light intensity in which this occurred was the same at that where the subjects could reliably discriminate colors. Therefore, similar to switching on of inhibition in mice, a stepwise change was observed in the spatial visual properties of human perception that corresponded to the light level at which cones are activated. This suggests that the switch circuitry we described in the mouse may be conserved in human vision. What are the potential benefits of the switch? First, in dim environments, it is necessary to gather as many photons as possible in order to detect objects of interest, while in bright conditions, one needs to discriminate between objects from the flood of thousands to millions of photons. In this context, it has been suggested that a loss of inhibitory surround would increase the area from which a ganglion cell could gather photons, making the cell more sensitive to photons arriving within its receptive field. If we consider the ability of these ganglion cells to quickly switch their spatial integration properties on and off during small changes in luminance, we can imagine a population of ganglion cells multitasking while looking at a single scene. The circuit we propose would allow each cell of this ganglion cell population to individually set their spatial integration properties instantaneously, depending on the local luminance level of the scene. This would allow the mosaic to multitask in a spatially structured manner, simultaneously performing different computations in separate portions of the visual field.